welcome everybody. Good morning. While you're waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website and we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realised before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk entitled Arrest, Remand and Build, Knowing Your Rights. My name is Chi En. I am an associate with Ma Wing Kwan Associates and I'll be your moderator and also one of the speakers for today's session. Now, before we begin today's session, allow me to introduce the firm and what we do. Ma Wing Kwan Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Datuk Ma Wing Kwan. Our ABLE team today comprises of 22 lawyers and a support team of 19. Datuk Ma is a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal Bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small medium enterprises or SMEs, family businesses and individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, including litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, a dedicated employment industrial relations team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were also broadcasted live. But with the COVID-19 Movement Control Order, or the MCO, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking of clients, for clients, potential clients, and also in-house counsel. Today is the 14th talk in our MWKA online talk series, which has been attended by some 3,000 attendees. Today, we are, we are expecting about 120 people who have registered. Please visit our website at mawingkwai.com for more information, to read our articles, and to sign up for more upcoming talks. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute legal advice. In the event you require specific legal advice to your matter, please contact us for complimentary legal consultation. Details will be given at the end of this talk. 
Now allow me to introduce our first speaker for today. Our first speaker is Ms. Vivian Fan. She is an associate in our Dispute Resolution and Individuals and Families Department. She holds a Bachelor of Laws from Cardiff University, Wales, UK. She was called to the Bar of England and Wales in a temple in 2016. Uh, she was admitted to the High Court of Malaya in 2017. Vivian's areas of practice include general litigation, debt recovery, criminal, construction, land acquisitions, probate and administration of estates, contractual disputes, and tenancy disputes. Hi everyone, yep, that's me. Um, let me introduce my co-speaker for today, and that is Wong Chien. Chien is an associate in our dispute resolution department and also the individuals and families department. She earned graduated with a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Leeds and was called to the Bar of England and Wales Middle Temple in 2018. He was admitted to the High Court of Malaya this year. And she earns area of practice include general litigation, construction, land disputes, land acquisition, corporate and commercial litigation, debt recovery, family law matters, criminal and JMB matters. We hope to complete today's talk by 11.45 and thereafter proceed with the Q&A um, Q session. If you have any questions, please don't forget to post them up on Slido and we'll address them later. You should have received a link to Slido during registration, but I will leave the slide in front of you for a while so that you can scan the QR code before we move on. Alternatively, you can go to Slido's webpage and key in the code 96019, I repeat 96019 at the bottom left corner. Since our talk today is focused on explaining to you about your rights and the procedures during a police arrest, remand proceedings and bail. We will give priority to those questions on Slido. If we have extra time, we will endeavor to answer your questions relating to other topics as best as we can. If we do not have enough time, please fill it in our feedback form, which will be given to you at the end of our talk, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Okay, let's start. So these are our top points today, five top points. I will cover the first three top points and Chien will take over to explain to you what happens when you're charged, what is bail and how do you obtain bail. As, as I've um, said just now, we are here to tell you the procedure during a police arrest and your rights especially. Your, your rights during a police arrest is entrenched under Article 5.1 of the Federal Constitution. It's a very, very important constitutional right of yours whereby it is stated that your life or personal liberty shall not be deprived unless it is in accordance with the law, which means you cannot be arrested unless the police follow the procedures and the law that comes with it. Okay, so what amounts to an arrest? More often than not, many people think that an arrest only occurs when the police handcuffs you. But we have to know that that is only in exceptional circumstances where the police have no choice but to handcuff you. Another form of arrest is when the police officer actually informs you you're under arrest. Kamu adalah ditahan. What happens if you're not sure whether you're being arrested? Say, the police stops you and say, oh, jangan bergerak, don't move. You have the right to ask and in fact, you should ask, am I under arrest? Because if you're not under arrest, if the police says, no, you're not under arrest, then you do not have to answer his questions. You can continue moving on or heading to wherever you are headed to. Another question that frequently arises is, can the police use force to arrest you? Yes, the police can use force to arrest you if you resist arrest. If the police already says, stop, do not move, you're under arrest and you continue moving or you disobey his order, then he can use force to arrest you. But what what kind of force can he use? Again, it goes down to the circumstances at that point in time, such as whether you are, you are resisting the arrest, then they can use reasonable force to arrest you. They cannot use brute force, but it's only what is necessary to arrest you and bring you to the police station. Okay, so what do you need to know when the police arrest you? First of all, as a preliminary point, you should first verify whether the police officer has authority to arrest you, okay? You should ask, you have the right to ask for his name and his ID card, and from his ID card, you can identify whether he has the authority. If it's red, 
he does not have the authority to arrest you and you do not have to listen to his orders because if it's red, it means that he's suspended. Other than that, the other colors such as blue, yellow, and white, they have the authority to arrest you. Take note of the color blue because it is for the rank of inspector and above, whereby most of the police powers can be exercised by rank of inspectors and above. The second thing you need to know, of course, is your rights if you are being arrested. What can you do? What should you not do? And what are the rights that you have to protect and not um, allow the police to breach your rights? This is very important because, say, somebody doesn't know their right and they can, any actions that they do may amount to waiver of um, that right of yours. I will explain in detail and go through it in chronological order. So these are the five rights that you need to do. Right to be informed, right to communicate, right to consult and be defended, to defer any questioning, which means any police interviews, until you get legal consultation, right to be released or brought before a court after 24 hours of detention, right to be informed. So once the police arrest you, what, what rights do you have? Number one, of course, just now, as I mentioned, you ask for his authority. You ask for his name, for his ID, and sometimes you can take a picture of his ID card in case you want to lodge a report against him for any misuse of police powers. The second, you have the right to ask the grounds of your arrest, such as, um, why am I being arrested? You have the right to ask because he has the obligation to tell you why are you being arrested. Say, let's say, um, I'm arresting you because you're suspected of committing the theft that occurred in the vicinity of this area. However, of course, um, the police doesn't have to inform you of the grounds of your arrest in circumstances where it is very clear. Say, let's say you're getting caught in the act. So um, if you're caught stealing or if you're caught entering somebody's house without permission, then obviously he doesn't need to tell you, hey, stop, I'm arresting you because you're stealing because it's common sense. The second is when the suspect makes it difficult to do so, meaning say um, there's a fight uh, ongoing or there's a robbery happening, uh, there's no way the police can, can inform you of the grounds. So because of the situation, because of the chaotic situation, then he doesn't need to inform you of your rights. Uh, sorry, I mean the grounds of the arrest. Okay, moving on, the right to communicate. So let's say the police arrest you, police inform you um, of the grounds of your arrest, and he brings you to the police station. At the police station, you have the right to communicate with two persons. You have the right to make two phone calls, one to your relative or a close friend of yours. Second, you have the right to contact a lawyer of your choice. Why? Okay, it makes sense. Look, I'm being arrested, I'm being brought to the police station, and I may be detained or kept in the police station or the prison for the next 24 hours. And it makes sense for you to be given the right to communicate, to tell them that you are arrested, that you've been arrested, which police station um, you're at, and for, for what offense you're suspected of. This makes sense because let's say you're gone on, and missing for 24 hours. So what if your relative or your friends go lodge a police report and say, look, this person is missing. So it makes sense that you have the right to call your relative, your friend, or a lawyer of your choice. However, such right can be denied, okay, again, only if it's authorized by an officer not below the rank of deputy, um, deputy superintendent police. And such right can be denied, i.e. the police can say, no, you cannot communicate, you're not allowed to call anyone. If the police thinks that he needs to take down your statement, he needs to interview you very urgently, okay, such as... Um, Okay, let me give you examples. Uh, he thinks that by allowing you to contact your friend, your relative or lawyer, it can lead to tampering of evidence. What does that mean? So let's say he, you're suspected of an offense, um, of a drug offense. And let's say you have stored, they, they found that this place uh, is where you store the drugs. Then he can deny you to call a friend or a relative because he's afraid that you may ask that person to remove the drugs from that place, meaning you remove the evidence um, from his investigation. Secondly, it's a situation where the police thinks that, oh, 
you may call your accomplice to tell them to run away. Otherwise, he's going to be arrested. That is um, another circumstance where he can deny you from calling your relative or your friend. Third point is safety. So let's just say um, you're suspected of an offense of rape. So in order to protect the victim or his, her family or his family, um, the police can again deny you the right to call your relative or your friend in case you tell them, oh, um, the police have caught me, can you please kill this person? Okay. However, most of the time, even though they deny you your right to call your friend or relative, you can or you should be allowed to consult your lawyer. It's very hard for the police to argue and say, no, you cannot call your lawyer because of tampering of evidence, accomplice avoiding arrest and other safety because the police is supposed to trust the lawyers, of course. I mean, we are all under the law. Third point, you have the right to consult and be defended by a lawyer of your choice. And the police officer must provide reasonable facilities for the communication to take place. It comes alongside with your right to defer any questioning, which means any police interview, until you are able to consult a lawyer. So let's say, brought to the police station, police says, I want to interview you now. And, um, but you said, no, I want to consult a lawyer. Then the police officer must allow you to contact your lawyer of your choice, wait for the lawyer to come, or wait for you to get uh, legal consultation before interviewing you. So defer meaning to delay the police interview until you get the legal consultation. So what happens during a police interview? What rights do you have? So most of the time you're being interviewed because it's either you're suspected of an offence or the police thinks that you have information and knowledge which can help his investigation in the um, in the case that he's investigating. So during a police interview, you have the right to remain silent. What, what is this right to remain silent that is often being spoken about? This right to remain silent means you have the right not to answer any questions which may incriminate you, which means which may expose you to a criminal offence. However, any other questions which the police ask, you're bound to answer them unless you think, again, unless you think it may expose you to a criminal offence. Otherwise, you're bound to answer them and you're supposed to answer them um, honestly and truthfully. So when the police ask you questions, you answer, the police will take down your answers. That's called recording a statement. So he's supposed to record all your answers in a document, okay, um, in accurate words, as, as accurate as he can. And then at the end of it, it's either he reads the whole statement to you or you have the right for it to, be, to, to ask for the statement, go through it, and then you're asked to confirm whether these are your answers. Once you confirm that these are your answers, then you can sign. Okay, what are your rights here? You have the right for it to be amended if you think that the police have recorded it wrongly. If you recorded something which you didn't say, all the more reason to say, look, I did not say this. Please remove this from this statement. Other than that, if language is a barrier, then I would advise if your police, if your lawyer is not with you at that time, we would advise you not to answer, not to give um, answers which you're not sure if whether it will it will be bad for you, especially when it comes to language barriers. So let's say you don't understand a certain language. Let's say police officers use um, Malay or English, and you're not. Uh, very familiar with the language. So when he's recording your statement when you're giving answers, it's better to give brief answers and or to say, look, I do not want to give any answers until my lawyer is here. Okay, and this one. Uh, this one writes, um, moving on, just now is a case where you're arrested, then you're brought to a police station and you're asked that you're asked questions, okay, immediately after arrest. But there are circumstances where the police calls you and say, um, look, can you please come to the police station this time, this day, at this police station? Uh, I need to interview you regarding this incident which occurred. Most of the time, police will give you a time and date, right? But if you're not 
convenient to attend at that particular time and date, then you should say, no, I'm not free on this date, but you should cooperate and tell him what other convenient time and place or, or date that you're suitable. Because if you do not comply, then the police can issue an order in writing to compel you to attend. If you disobey such order, the police can go to the court to ask for a warrant of arrest to arrest you. So I, we would usually advise, yes, if the police calls you to go to a police station for interview, go do it. Um, especially if you have done nothing wrong, go do it. But again, remember what are your rights during a police interview. You can ask for legal consultation. You can ask for it to be delayed until you get legal consultation. And remember, you do not have to answer questions which may lead you to, um, to an offence. Okay, this is important. So after arrest, after interview, what happens? Can they detain you? Can they keep you in the police station or in a prison? Yes, they can. In fact, they can keep you there for a total of 24 hours. 24 hours, remember. And 24 hours start from the time of arrest. And what is the purpose of detaining you further? So you may think, oh, the police has already taken my, taken my statement. Um, why does he need to detain me? Is it lawful? Yes, it is. Because within the 24 hours, the police is supposed to conduct his investigation and he thinks that he needs to keep you there so that you, you do not interfere with his investigation. He thinks that, oh, if he lets you out, you're going to tamper the evidence. You're going to disturb the witnesses. You're going to ask your accomplice to run away. All these reasons. So that's why the, the law allows the, the police to keep you for 24 hours for him to do his preliminary investigation. So what happens after the 24 hours? Two things. You have to be released unless the police officer applies for a remand order from the magistrate, the court, to extend the detention period. So which means after 24 hours, yes, the police can detain you further, but he needs an order from the magistrate. Otherwise, he has to release you. Um, because breach of these provisions is actually a breach of your constitutional right, as I've highlighted at the beginning of the talk. And this question is also frequently asked, how long can the detention period be extended? Note, they can make two applications to, to extend your detention period. Depends on the offences you are suspected of. So if you're suspected of an offence with imprisonment of less than 14 years, they can only detain you for a further of seven days. The first application, four days. Second application, three days. If the offence is punishable with imprisonment of more than 14 years, they can detain you for a total of 14 days. First application, seven days. Second application, seven days. Of course, I'm sure all of you won't know whether the offence is punishable um, with imprisonment of less than 14 years or more than 14 years. So it's very important, again, to consult your lawyer at the very beginning when you're arrested. Otherwise, you can always ask the police um, what offence are you suspected of? Then you ask, what is the sentence for that offence? The exceptions are the Immigration Act. If a non-citizen is arrested and detained, that non-citizen can be detained for 14 days. Unlike our minimum 7-7 seven, seven, or 3-4, this is 14 days. For drug dependence, it's also 14 days. Can you be represented during a remand application? Meaning, when the police go and apply to detain you further, can you be legally represented? The answer is yes, because during the remand application, your defense counsel or your lawyer is supposed to be, there, to be there and say, no, I don't think this person should be detained any longer. You have 24 hours to do your preliminary investigation. There's no other reasons why you should detain him. Most of the time, police will use reasons such as, oh, I need to wait for um, the pathology report for drug offenses, say, or the chemist report or um, I need to take his fingerprints, or I need I identification. All these reasons are not grounds to detain you further. These are the things that he needs to do and he should have done within that 24 hours. He doesn't need to detain you any longer to do those things. Grounds of detaining you further, it's only if the police thinks that by releasing you, you will interfere with his investigation. Okay? And what happens after the detention period? Um, a very important thing to note here is if your detention period has been extended, you need to take note of the time where uh, you're supposed to be released. Say you were arrested at 5 p.m. 24 hours later, it has to be 5 p.m. as well. Take note of the time. 
the court cannot just um, extend it by giving an order by way of saying the number, the, the date. So, oh, yeah, um, it's extended for two days. No, the court has to say the time and the date exactly. And you have to take note because you have to be released once the detention period is over. Or if the police thinks that um, his investigation is enough, he's got the necessary information, he can bring it to the court to be charged. So he either releases you or he, charge, he brings you to the court to be charged. Okay, here. So now that you're clear about your rights during an arrest um, and remand, what happens if you're stopped during the movement control order, which is enforced now? The movement control order is actually the prevention and control of infectious diseases, declaration of infected local areas order 2020. This, under this order, regulations have been passed to prevent and control the pandemic COVID-19 in areas declared as infected local areas. For your information, the whole of Malaysia has been declared as infected local areas. And under the regulations, um, your movement is restricted unless it falls in any of the exceptions, in any of the purposes stated. So I'm sure you all know, you can only move from one place to another, if you need to buy food, if you need uh, to seek medical health, um, or if you need, if 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 you fall under, if you fall under um, one of the essential essential services listed in the regulations. So what happens if you're stopped during the MCO? Okay, this is interesting because at, when you're stopped at a police roadblock and you're asked where to go, when you're asked where to go, you're supposed to answer, oh I'm. Where you're where you going? You're supposed to answer, yes, I'm going to this place, this place. And if you're caught breaching the order, say you intend to go to this place which is further than 10 kilometers, or say you're actually going to this place but you're, you're not going to buy food, you're going to visit your friend. I, we would advise you to answer the police say, um, and apologize and say, okay, uh, I'm sorry I've committed this, 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 this. Um, and what happens next? Can the police arrest you and bring you to the police station? Technically speaking, procedurally, the police cannot arrest you because this MCO, this regulation, is a non seizable offence, which means that the police cannot arrest you without a warrant. However, take note, the police can use Section 186 of the Penal Code, which says that you're obstructing the police officer from carrying out his duty which is a seizable offence, then he can arrest you without an, a warrant. But if it's just purely breach of the MCO, he's not supposed to arrest you. What he can do is issue a summons to attend court. Okay, and here, this is important. The offence is punishable with either six months of imprisonment maximum or a fine of not more than 1,000 or both. Based on my experience, the court will usually, I mean, because of the um, pandemic COVID-19 happening now, the court has been imposing fines um, and not imprisonment. And another interesting case to note is the case of public prosecutor versus um, Chin Chi Wei. If you have heard the news about these two men who went fishing, uh, they were caught actually at a near a fishing pond with um, their fishing rods. So they, they were arrested because they breached the MCO. They were, they were at a place not to buy food, not for anything, but to fish. And that is clearly not allowed under the regulations. So what happened? These people actually pleaded guilty. They were convicted and they were sentenced to three months imprisonment. Interestingly, the Taiping High Court judge called for the records at the same time the defense counsel asked for a review of the sentence because they think that the sentence is too high. The High Court judge actually went through the records and he thinks that imprisonment of three months is too excessive. Number one, yes, this case is for the public interest we need to um, impose a punishment. You know, we need to punish these people for breaching the regulations. They are threatening the life of others. However, the court also have to look at the circumstances of the people who committed the offense. So look, in this case, the court noted, these two men actually went fishing because according to them, they needed to fish for food for the family. Okay, because if I'm not wrong, they're construction workers. The thing is, yes, um, they need food, they were fishing. But that is not allowed. Unfortunately, that is not allowed. But taking a look at their situation, they have families to take care of. You cannot put them in jail. 
What more during this pandemic COVID-19? It is not right to put them in jail. You're weighing public interest. Yes, you should punish, punish these people, but at the same time, punishing them doesn't mean that you have to um, expose them to COVID-19. What if they bring in COVID-19 to, to the prison? That's endangering all the lives in prison, the current inmates. So what the court did was, the court also considered, what about fine? Should we impose a fine? The court thinks, no, because these two people are already so poor, they already do not have daily income, that it doesn't make sense to impose a fine. Because if you impose a fine, they can't pay. Then in the end, in default of payment of the fine, they will be in prison as well. It defeats the whole purpose. So what the court did was, the court actually sentenced to compulsory attendance uh, daily at the para compulsory attendance center and undertake compulsory work for three months. The court thinks you breach something, you endanger the life of the public, now you have to go back to the public and serve the public. Okay? Um, and so, so this is the sentence. Compulsory attendance order with a bond with one surety of 500, which means if you do not do it, then um, the guarantor has to pay 500 ringgit. And this is, this is fair because under such dire financial circumstance, obviously that person will want to comply, otherwise I have to fork out another 500 ringgit, right? However, because of COVID-19 happening, the court has actually postponed um, the sentence. So in the meantime, they just have to report to the police once a week, every Monday at the police station. So um, to recap, when you're stopped by police on duty during MCO, you're you are asked for your name, your address, where you're headed to. Just answer these questions. Cooperate with the police. Do not defy the police because you don't want yourself to be caught in a situation where um, the police says you're defying my orders, you're defying the police. Then it will, it will lead to more serious consequences. Um, based, okay, another point to note is, before I end my session, um, during the, the, the recent trend is that they will stop you and if they think that you, you breached the MCO, they will bring it to the police station. They will take down your statement and then they will say, okay, you come back on this date to report to the police station. Uh, we will decide, the, pros the prosecution will decide whether to charge you in court or to take no further action. So it really depends whether you will be charged in court um, for breaching the offence. Okay, I'll pass the floor to Chien and he'll explain to you what happens when you're charged in court, what is bail and how you obtain bail. Over to you, Chien. Thank you, Vivian. I will now continue with the remaining talk points, which are what happens when you're charged, what is bail, and how do you obtain bail. What happens when you're charged? First, you will be brought to the court to be charged. The procedure is governed under Section 173 of the Criminal Procedure Code. Uh, firstly, when you are brought to the court, the charge containing the particulars of the offence uh, will be read out to you and explained to you in a language that you can understand. If you do not understand the language which it is asked, you can ask for it to be read out in the language that you can understand. Now, after reading the charge, uh, you will be asked again whether or not you understand the charge. If you understand the charge against you, you will then be asked whether or not you intend to plead guilty to the charge. Or in Malay, we usually call it kamu nak mengaku salah atau tidak. Now, if you plead guilty, or mengaku salah, the court interpreter will read out maximum sentence of the offence that you are charged with and confirm if you still want to uh, plead guilty. Now, if you intend to plead guilty, if that is your decision to maintain your guilty plea, the court interpreter will inform the judge that you have decided to plead guilty and then the judge will uh, record your conviction or uh, what we usually call it, uh, enter a guilty plea. And after that, the judge will proceed to ask both parties, the prosecution and your def you, your defense counsel, to, to submit on sentencing. So the prosecution, on one hand, will submit on what sentence should be imposed uh, and why uh, the sentence is appropriate. So, for example, if... The, the prosecution may say that, oh, you are a repeated offender, you, this is not your first time committing such offences. Um, and also some other factors such as uh, for public interest reasons that you should have a heavier sentence. 
uh, they want to ask the court to impose a heavier sentence. On the other hand, you or your defense counsel, your lawyer representing you, will submit and mitigate for a lower or a lighter sentence. However, please note that uh, whether or not a lower sentence is imposed, it depends on the court's discretion. The court can decide to uh, impose a lower sentence or the court can maintain the sentence uh, as per what the prosecution is seeking for. So I have listed down here a few mitigating factors uh, that are commonly used in court uh, to, to mitigate for a lower sentence. So as you can see here, uh, the court may consider your criminal record. So let's say if you are a first time offender, then this may be one of the factors that you can raise as your mitigating factor to say that, oh, uh, this is your first time, so the court may take into account this to, to decide that uh, maybe the sentence should be lowered. Secondly, age is also another factor. Uh, if you are of a young age, then as I said, the court may take this into account and say that, okay, since because you are still young, uh, lower sentence should be imposed. Thirdly, medical condition is also another factor. Let's say if you have a serious condition and need you need a uh, serious medical attention, uh, which would not be very feasible in if you are imposed a heavy sentence. And lastly, uh, financial capabilities. This is especially um, one of the most commonly used factor if uh, the sentence imposed is, let's say a payment of fine. Now, after hearing both parties submission, the judge will then proceed to order sentence against you. If you decide to plead not guilty or tidak mengaku salah, or even if you refuse to plead, if you refuse to plead, actually it, it will be deemed that you decide to plead not guilty. Now, if you decide to plead not guilty, then the court interpreter will inform the judge and the judge will then record your not guilty plea, which means your case will be set for trial. So as I said here, um, the judge will fix a next mention date to proceed to trial. So what happens to you between the period of you pleading not guilty and the next mention date? I mean, what will happen to you? Are you going to be detained or, or released? So you or your defense counsel will ask for you to be released on bail pending the next mention date. Of course, you have to submit on why you should be released on bail. So what is bail? Now, before I move on to my next point, which is to explain what bail is and the bail application and the process, let me just do a quick recap of the procedure of uh, when you are charged. This is just a summarized version of what I have explained earlier. So first, you'll be brought to court to be charged. And after that, the court will ask whether or not you intend to plead guilty. If you intend to plead guilty, then the court, the judge will record your conviction and proceed to sentencing. <clears throat> and that is where you will be allowed to uh, submit on mitigating factors on asking for a lower sentence. On the other hand, if you plead not guilty, your case will be set for trial, or other, in other words, claim trial. Now, pending the trial, you or your defense counsel will apply to court for bail. If you do not apply for bail, then, or if the court refuse bail, then you will be detained pending your trial. Now, moving on to my next point, which is, what is bail? The P criminal procedure court doesn't provide a definition for bail. So let's look at uh, this case law, which is the case of Yusuf bin Muhammad against public prosecutor. So, in this case, it says that bail means security taken from a person to appear on a fixed date before a court. The meaning of the word bail as ordinarily and commonly understood is to set free a person who is under arrest, detention, or is under some kind of restraint by taking security for his appearance. So what does this mean? It simply means that the court may release you on certain conditions pending your next court appearance. So the condition is usually to deposit a sum of money, uh, what we call security or bill sum. You deposit the money into court and you give an undertaking to ensure your subsequent attendance, uh, court attendance through, throughout the trial. 
how do you obtain bail? Uh, or are you entitled to bail? Well, it depends on the category of offence that you are charged with. Here, I have listed down three scenarios, three possible scenarios. The first one is, yes, you are entitled to bail, provided that you are charged with a bailable offence. If you are charged with a bailable offence, then the court will, cannot deny you bail. The second one is, it depends on the court whether or not to allow or to grant you bail. This is where you are charged with what we call a non-bailable offence. So the court will take into account uh, the seriousness of the offence or, or even the facts of the case before deciding on whether or not to grant you bail. Now the third scenario is, no, you are not entitled to bail. If you are charged with what we call it an uh, unbailable offence, this means that the, con uh, the court cannot grant you bail at all. So what are these, uh, as I mentioned, what are these bailable, non-bailable and unbailable offences? Let's look into that in detail. So for bailable offences, which is governed under Section 387 of the Criminal Procedure Code, the Criminal Procedure Code actually provided a list of offences which are bailable or non-bailable offences in the first schedule of the Criminal Procedure Code. Now, going back to bailable offence, as I mentioned earlier, bailable offences means that uh, if you're charged under bailable offences, it means that bail should be granted to you as of right. Or in other words, the court cannot deny you bail. So bailable offences are usually less serious offences, which carry lighter or lower sentence. Lighter sentence in the sense that uh, the imprisonment will be, let's say, for uh, less than three years or fine. So an example of a bailable offence would be, let's say, trespass. Going on to the second offence, which is a non-bailable offence, the court has the discretion to decide whether or not to grant you bail. So it is not like the bailable offence, which is as of right. This one is, it is not as of right. These non-bailable offences are usually most, more serious offences, which carry, carry heavier sentences. So for example, offences which are more than three years imprisonment, imprisonment for life, or even punishable by death. So an example of a non-bailable offence would be, uh, let's say, murder. Now, still on non-bailable offence, how then does the court decide whether or not to grant you bail? Now, if the offence is punishable by death, as I mentioned, punishable by death, or it is uh, life imprisonment, then the court will not grant you bail if there are reasonable grounds to believe that you have committed such offence unless if you are uh, under 16 or if you are a woman or you are uh, medically ill. On the other hand, if the offence is not punishable by death or life imprisonment, then the court may decide to grant bail based on several factors. I have listed down a few examples here. Uh, seriousness of the offence or danger of absconding. So the court may take into account whether or not you have the tendency of uh, not attending court or, or leave, fleeing the country on, or such matters. Or the court may take into account the danger of repeated offence, let's say if you have uh, previous offences or you have previous criminal records of committing such an offence, then these are the one of the uh, many factors that the court will take into account. Now, on the last offence, which is unbailable offence, these are offences which uh, may involve some other provisions other than the uh, Criminal Procedure Code. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, these type of offences, the court cannot grant you bail at all. So, a few examples here. Uh, offences relating to terrorism, kidnapping offences or offences which are under Section 3 of the Firearms Increased Penalties Act 1971. Now, as you are in detention and since your family members or friends would have already been informed of the date that you will be charged in court, your family members or relatives or friends will have to be present in court to, to help you manage, uh, manage the administrative side of uh, applying for the bill. So as you can see, uh, you need to contact someone to help you 
bail you out. Uh, this is what we call a bailer. So who can be a bailer? Well, you have to fulfill certain requirements to be a bailer. The first is that you have to be above 18 years old. Uh, you have to be a Malaysian citizen. For non-citizen bailers, you, uh, you may be subjected to certain other conditions imposed by the court. For foreign accused, the bailer will also be a Malaysian citizen. And the last point is self-explanatory in the sense that the bailer has to understand all the conditions imposed by the court and is also able to pay the bill sum fixed by the court. Now, what is your responsibility as a bailer? Your responsibility as a bailer is to ensure that uh, the accused or you, the defendant's attendance in court on the dates fixed by the court. So if you fail to attend court your family member or friend who is the bailer will have to attend court and explain why you did not attend court. Furthermore, the bail sum deposited by the bailer will also be forfeited if you fail to attend your subsequent court date. Now, so far I've been talking about bail sum, a uh, sum of money being deposited in the court. However, this is not always the only condition which is imposed by the court because the court may also decide to impose uh, further conditions to ensure your attendance in court. So I have listed down a few examples here. So for example, you might have to report to the police station on a weekly basis, or you might have to surrender your passport to uh, the court, for example. So you will not be able to travel overseas. Also, there might be some restrictions on your movement. Um, it depends on the, on your case, but uh, there might be some restrictions on movements. For example, you are not allowed to approach the complainant, for example. Now, let's go on to talk about the bail process. First, your family member or your friend uh, who is going to be the bailer will have to go to the court registry uh, or the bail counter to process your bail. Uh, you have to produce, the, the bailer has to produce the uh, his I see, and also to show that uh, show his accounts to uh, as a payment to be used as payment of the bill sum. And lastly, the court will explain the conditions of the bill and also to you. And both you and the bailer will then execute the bail bond. What happens if you breach the conditions of the bill? So, as I have mentioned earlier the bailer will be summoned to court to answer to the judge of your non-attendance. Uh, another, another consequence will be that the bail sum will be forfeited. Also, the court may issue a war warrant of arrest on you. And lastly, if uh, the court thinks fit, the court may also revoke your bail. Or if the court doesn't want to re uh, revoke your bail, the court may impose stricter conditions on your next appearance in court. Now, what about offense under MCO? The, the, uh, if you commit an offense under the regulations, are you entitled to bail? Yes, because uh, the offense is considered as a bailable offense, uh, which is an offense not exceeding three years of imprisonment. Vivian, do you have anything else to add before I move on to questions? Thanks, Jen. Uh, thank you, Jen, for explaining the process of charge and bail. If you're wondering what happens if um, you are charged for an MCO offence, what generally happens is, uh, for now, during this COVID-19, you the police stops you, police brings you to the police station, take down your statement and say, look, come back to the police station on this date. Otherwise, I'll meet you in court, I will inform you. So as the date gets closer, the police will tell you probably two days or one day before you have to attend court, the police will... Um, contact you and say, meet me at, in court at this time. Then in court, like what Chien has explained, your name will be called, you'll be asked to go to the front um, where the, the, the accused have to stand and then we'll read the charge to you. You can choose, if you don't understand the language that's being read, you can choose and ask the court to read it in a language that you understand. So if it's in Malay, you can say, no, I do not understand Malay. I want it to be read in English or Mandarin or any other language that you're most familiar with. And the court cannot deny you that right. After that, if you, you'll be asked whether to plead guilty or not. If you say, yes, I plead guilty, the court will ask you, this offense is punishable with 
imprisonment of six months or a fine maximum of 1,000. Do you still plead guilty? Then you have to confirm yes or no. After that, the court will ask parties to submit on mitigation points, like what Chien has explained to us just now. Um, so parties will throw in factors, oh, he's low income, he's a first-time offender, and all these things. The court is supposed to take into consideration and then sentence you either a fine or imprisonment. For MCO offences, um, for now, the court has been issuing fine. And take note on the most recent news is that it will not be recorded as a criminal conviction in the Royal Police Registra Register. But that does not mean you have the right to breach or, you know, it does not mean that, oh, I just have to pay a fine. Um, it's fine. I can travel. I can do this. I can do that. No, you shouldn't because really it, the hassle and the time and really the embarrassment of being in court and how you're getting treated in court by the police. Sometimes these things, the, the ill treatment or the abuse of powers, sometimes it's not within your control. And trust me, you don't want to go through that. So yeah, let's follow the rules. Um, with that, I have no further questions. Oh, before that, one more point. Whatever that we have explained today applies to um, white-collar crimes. It's not just offences under the penal code, but uh, white-collar crimes such as uh, quasi-criminal crimes under the, say, Capital Markets um, and Services Act or any, uh, anything to do with securities. Um, the same procedures, your rights and everything are still the same. Uh, with that, I have no further no 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 additional things to add. Let's move on to the Q and A. Uh, okay, we will now take questions that some of you have posted on Slido. Before I move on to the questions, uh, remember that you can ask questions on Slido either by scanning this QR code or going to Slido's web page and key in the code nine six zero one nine. So the first question is in the case of uh, where the accused does not know any lawyer, will the police seek a lawyer for him? Well, you are entitled to legal representation. However, I don't think that the police will seek a lawyer for you. So you are entitled to contact, if you actually, if you don't know uh, any lawyer, you can contact YBGK. Uh, it's a national legal aid department, if I'm not mistaken. Even do you have anything to add? Mm, I'll add on to that. Yes, legally, uh, they will not take the effort to find a lawyer for you. But um, in real circumstances, they actually have contacts to lawyers. And um, the thing is, they, they have close contacts and they will try to pass your case to those lawyers because they are associated in one way or another. Um, we would advise you to call your friend or your relative to go and find a good lawyer for you and do not, do not try to, I mean, if, if possible, try to get your own lawyer and not based on the police recommendation. Thank you, Vivian. Let's move on to the next one. Does police bantuan have the same powers like powers of arrest, search, seizure as a police? Police bantuan is appointed in the Police Act 1967. So I would say that they have the same powers of uh, as a police however they are restricted to the uh, that particular vicinity of the area only as compared to uh, a police officer who is who has the powers uh, to arrest or search or uh, in in public do you have anything else to add Vivian? Yeah, that's correct, Jian. Um, basically, a police bantuan is, is, is appointed for the vicinity, he's correct. And most of the powers, such as powers of arrest, or because he's there to prevent or um, detect crimes. So if there's a crime, he has the authority to go and arrest the offender. Now, oh, the third question, if the right to consultation can be denied, how long can they deny this? And if the remand is for max of four plus three, is there no consultation at all? Uh, maybe, Vivian, you can take this question. Thanks, Jian. Uh, the thing is, when the right to consultation is denied at the first instance, you can ask again when your uh, remand, when, do, when your detention period is extended. Yeah. So you can, at the end of each detention period, ask. There's no harm asking. Uh, can I please 
seek my lawyer. Can I please seek my lawyer? And depends on the circumstances. Sometimes the police will allow and sometimes not. The police, to answer your question, the police has the right to still deny you um, the right to consultation. Uh, moving on to the next one. Uh, can police take my handphone? Well, I believe that the police is not allowed to uh, confiscate your handphone in public. However, if you're talking about uh, investigation, some ongoing investigation when you are in the police of uh, police station, then yes, I would say that police can confiscate your handphone uh, during an investigation. Yes, correct. That's correct. Um, because basically, this is to do with the police powers under stop, search and seize. Can he seize your handphone for investigation purposes? So basically, under the Communications and Multimedia Act, uh, if I'm not wrong, Section 247, he has, the police has authority okay, to seize your phone for investigation purposes, but the police needs to get a warrant to search and seize from the magistrate. So otherwise, without a warrant, he can't do it unless, unless um, you're suspected for an offence of national security or um, such as an offence under SOSMA. I'm sure you've heard of SOSMA. Or any, any offences which threaten uh, national security, then he has the right to take your phone uh, for investigation. Apart from that, interestingly, um, the police, uh, another point to add to that, once the police gets the um, warrant to search and seize your phone, the police actually can ask for your password because most of the time you get stopped, police shows you a warrant, look, I, I, or rather, sorry, the police comes to your house and say, I need to search your house, I need to search, uh, please open up your computer, please give me your passwords and all these things. The police can do that under Section 116B of the Criminal Procedure Code. And you have to comply, you have to give the passwords because the police will say, I need those data for further investigation. But remember, a warrant needs to be uh, granted by the court before he can do that. So if he comes to your house, you ask, ask for the warrant. Can you show me your warrant of search? If he doesn't show, then ask him for grounds. Why, why, why do you not have a warrant? Okay. Thank you, Vivian. Let's move on to the next one. Can a suspect insist to have his lawyer with him when the police is interviewing him? I believe you can have a lawyer. You can insist that you have a lawyer with you uh, during the uh, interview. This is provided uh, that because you have a, a right to a legal representation, then yes, during uh, interview or investigations, you can have a lawyer by your side when the police is interviewing you. Uh, even you have anything else to add? No, that's good, Chien. Normally in practice, how long will the accused have to wait pending trial? Uh, it depends on the case. Uh, it could take weeks or it could even take months. I have seen uh, some cases which uh, which take up to three to four months, but it really depends on the, the case and the court schedule. Uh, I think due to time constraint, uh, we might take a, just a few more questions. Do these rights apply only to Malaysian citizens or are non-Malaysians protected under these laws regarding arrest and remand as well? Uh, even maybe you can take this question. Thanks, Yuan. Yes, these are your rights apply to everyone, apply to everyone who's staying in Malaysia um, because uh, if you're arrested, bail or what, any of these, um, you have the same rights as a non-Malaysian. But um, as I've mentioned just now, there are certain provisions under the Immigration Act which apply to non-citizens such as um, if let's say invalid visa, then uh, you're not entitled to bail um, or they can detect. Uh, detain you for uh, 14 days minimum instead of our minimum um, 7, 7 or 4, 3. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Now let's move on to the next one. Before we month, can a lawyer ask to, or check with the police for the investigation paper or diary? Even maybe you can take this question as well. So before we month, uh, or in fact, during remand, if you're represented by a defense counsel, if you're represented by a lawyer, 
the lawyer cannot ask for the investigation paper or diary. Actually, to be more accurate, it's not the investigation paper, it's the diary. Um, because it's supposed to note down all his investigation details in the diary. It only becomes an investigation paper once he has uh, finalized it and passed it to the prosecution. So can you, have, can you ask for his diary? No, you cannot. Only the magistrate can have a look at his diary. So um, during remand, what you, the most the lawyer can do is uh, refer or ask permission from the magistrate to look into the diary of the police to make sure that whatever he's saying is actually written, that he did not breach any of um, his police powers or he did not exceed the detention period. Because if he does not follow, then the remand, then he won't get his remand order. So you, the, the lawyer can ask the court, the magistrate, to look into the diary, but you cannot look into the diary yourself. So that's why we advise you to get a lawyer as soon as possible, because if you represent yourself during a remand proceedings, it's very likely that the police will get the detention period that he wants, because there's no one there to, to, to do a check on him. Okay, thank you, Vivian. Let's move on to the next one. What if my lawyer is with me but I still refuse to answer the police's question. Will my silence be held against me? Uh, thanks, Suen, for the question. Um, if your lawyer is with you and you still refuse to answer, no, your silence will not be held against you because you're not in court. Uh, you're not giving evidence in court. So um, you have the right not to answer the question, but you have to say, uh, I'm not answering your question. I will answer the question in court. So no. This, your silence will not be held against you. Thank you, Vivian. In what circumstances will police bail be given? How about for the case of court bail as well? Uh, maybe, Vivian, you can answer on the police bail and I can answer for the court bail. Yeah. Uh, to answer you on the police bail, it really depends on the police. Police bail, in other words, is jamming mulut. So you are arrested and the police want to detain you. Try to ask for a police bail. Try to say, okay, please let me go. I need to take care of my children. I promise I'll come back and report to the police station. Um, I will, sometimes the police, most of the time the police bail comes with the condition that you have to have a guarantor. Uh, other, other circumstances, the police will ask you to deposit a sum of money. Um, but most of the time, especially for MCO offenses, uh, you just have to have a guarantor contact number and you have to sign a declaration form to say, um, I will come back on this date as I have promised. And Chien can elaborate on the court bail. Yes. So I think I believe I have covered this uh, in my slides earlier on. But to answer your question, uh, it depends on the offense that you are charged with. So it depends whether or not uh, it's a bailable or non bailable or unbailable offense. Uh, as I said, bailable offense, it usually, uh, bailable offenses are usually offenses which carry sentences, sentences which are three years or less imprisonment. So in that kind of cases, if you, you are charged with a bailable offence, then the court cannot deny you bail. You are entitled to bail. However, this is provided that you, uh, you have a bailer to, to bail you out. In si situations where you cannot afford bail or you don't have a bailer, then, then you will not be able, then the court will not be Granting you bill because you don't have bailer. Yep, that's right. Um, so we'll move on to the next one. If the suspect was arrested on Monday 9 a.m. and then the police in bring for remand on Wednesday 10 a.m., police tell the court that the suspected was arrested on Tuesday 11 a.m. How to check? Okay, I think your question means how do you check, how do you ensure that you're not detained for more than 24 hours during your first detention period? Okay, again, the, um, the police is supposed to record all these details in his diary. So he's supposed to state the time he gets the order for investigation, the time you're arrested, the time and date you're arrested. And then clearly from that, you can be able to uh, derive 24 hours, right? But how do you ensure, how do you do check and balance? Like I said, during remand proceedings, it's always better to have a lawyer. Your lawyer there will ask the court, look, magistrate, um, one magistrate, can you please look into the IO's diary? My client informed me that I was arrested at this time and 24 hours should expire at this time. So can you please check into his diary and confirm that he did not exceed the 24 hours? So have your lawyer there. Your lawyer will get 
will, will be a check and balance and make sure that the 24 hours is not exceeded. I hope that answers your question. I thank you, Vivian. Let's move on to the next one. Can I take video from the time I am stopped and arrested by the police? Uh, I believe that there's uh, no laws to prevent anyone from taking videos or pictures uh, in public. However, this is provided that you do not obstruct the police when uh, you are stopped by the police or, or if you are arrested by the police. Right. Uh, I think due to time constraint, I think we'll take this one last question. Foreigners were arrested by police for alleged criminal offence but found no case, but the visa has expired. It's now detained in the red house due to MCO. Can they sue the government? Uh, even can you take the question? Yeah, okay. So um, they are arrested for breach of MCO, but then found that no, there's no breach of MCO, but instead they found that their visa has expired. So if your visa has expired, that is against the law under the Immigration Act. Therefore, they can detain you and then bring you to court to be charged for not having a val valid visa. Um, on top of that, if you're asking whether they can sue the government for this, is a, I'll just put it as a general question. Can uh, suspects or can you sue the government if they unlawfully arrest you or they use misuse of police, uh, sorry, abuse of police powers or treat or ill treat you? Can you sue the government? Yes, you can. You can take a civil action. You can, in your civil action, you will sue the government, you will sue the police, you will sue the Royal uh, P um, PDRM, Royal Malaysia Police, for damages that you have suffered due to um, what the police has done to you. Other than that, I would advise you if the police have abused their powers against you, then make a complaint. There's no harm lodging a complaint through the EAIC, uh, which is the Enforcement Agency uh, Com Commission, or um, even SISPA, S-I-S-P-A-A. -A. So lodge a complaint, don't be scared, um, and the necessary actions will be taken against them. All right, thank you for your questions today. Sorry, um, we cannot answer all your questions. Uh, but feel free to drop them in the feedback form and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Remember, um, these are your rights. Uh, don't be scared, but of course, don't defy the police. Um, comply whenever possible, whenever reasonable, as long as your rights are protected and always seek lawyer advice at the very start, at the very beginning. Okay, thanks for attending. All right, thank you, Vivian, for your insights. That's the end of the Q&A, as mentioned. Before I conclude, please, uh, I, have, I have a few announcements to make. First, please join us again for upcoming talks. On Wednesday, on the 6th of May, 11 a.m., our partner, Mr. Gan Chong Chie, and our associate, Ms. Wong Su En, will give a talk on debt recovery during and after the MCO. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk. The link to the form will be posted in the chat. Uh, as informed earlier by Vivian, you, if you have any other questions which we did not manage to answer earlier, please fill it in in the feedback form and we will get back to you as soon as we can. We appreciate your comments so that we can continue to improve our MWKA online talk series for you in the future. Thirdly, please do follow or like our social media accounts. Fourthly, if you would like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the telephone or over video conference. Please fill in the form or our, on our website. The link is also posted in the chat. I will leave this for a few seconds if you want to scan the QR code. All right. To our guests, thank you for joining us. We hope you found today's session informative and useful. Thank you, everybody, and we hope to see you at our next talk. Stay safe and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.